we're now going to remember what we've been singing. We're going to proclaim what we've been singing, that God loves us in his love, his commitment, the surety of our salvation for all who love him, who believe in him. That is the basis by which we know we will persevere in this life of faith. Everything that we face in life, the reality of, of what's kept you up at night, maybe the things that were on your mind as you came into church today, and the realities that you'll face when you leave, no matter how challenging, no matter how overwhelming they are, must be put into perspective by the cross. We're going to be opening our Bibles up to Romans chapter 8. If you don't have a Bible, can you raise your hand? We have some men who would love to give you one. If you don't own a Bible, this is yours to keep. Open to Romans chapter 8. We're going to be verse 31 and 32. Here we are reaching the pinnacle, the mountaintop of perhaps the most glorious mountain peak of the gospel in all of scripture. Paul's been speaking of the gospel for eight chapters, and in this chapter in particular, he has just declared that for those who love God, for those who've been called by him, adopted as God's children, given the Holy Spirit, all things work together for good. That God accomplishes our salvation from front to back. That's what we just sang. Christ is ours forever more, not because of what we have done. But if you're saved, he started your salvation. He gives you all that you need in your salvation and he will bring it to completion. God accomplishes our salvation from front to back. He foreknows, he predestines to conformity with Christ. He calls, he justifies he glorifies, and those are presented in the past tense because they are as good as accomplished for all who believe. And then Paul asks a rhetorical question here, 831. He says, what then, looking back, what then, what therefore shall we say to these things? We are drawn into these texts. Christian, you can't sit back and look at these gospel truths as if they're Maybe something like a, a textbook to be read and studied or, or maybe a, a logical proposition to be understood. But you must know the theological truths of salvation, adoption, justification, glorification in a way that affects you, in a way that affects us. That's why Paul asks the question, what shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? The obvious answer is no one. But you must come, we must come to grips with that implication. If these things are true that God has, that Paul has just laid forth, if the gospel is true, and it is, who can be against those who have been called, those who've been predestined, those who have been justified? In light of our eminent, our unavoidable glorification, if God set you on this trajectory of salvation, who could be against us? The focus here is on God the Father's relationship between himself and his adopted children. God is for the elect in a unique way. In a unique way that's not for everyone. So I need you to know that in order to be included in this us, in this we that we're talking about, that we're reading about, you must meet that condition that's presented previously for those who love God, for those who are called according to his purpose. This is a truth that you can't get. You can't get on God's side because you did enough good works. You can't gain God's favor because you were religious enough, maybe because you weren't as bad as your neighbor or or even if you're the best person you know, you won't earn God's favor. This is a favor that is bestowed on us despite us. And because it is despite us, nobody can undo it, not even us. 
Paul asks a question in a, the same question in a few more ways in the verses that follow this, who can be against us question. Verse 33, what does he ask? He says, who shall bring a charge against God's elect? Right? If God is for us, if his salvation is not because you are blameless, but despite your sin, who's going to bring a charge? Who can condemn? Verse 34. And then verse 35. Can, can affliction, turmoil, persecution, sword, nakedness, peril, even death separate us from the love of Christ? The point isn't that if you're God's child, you will be protected from experiencing these things. The threat of condemnation. Maybe the threat of persecution. Even protected from somebody putting a sword to your neck and saying, deny Christ or I'll separate you from your head. But even if you are separated from your head, you will not be separated from the love of Christ. Right? The point isn't that if you're God's child, you will be protected from trial, but you will be protected in those things. This side of glory, God's children will face turmoil. You will face persecution, maybe hunger, and even death. But we will face these things differently in light of God being for us. Leon Morris comments on this. He, he says, Paul means that with God for us, it makes not the slightest particle of difference who is against us. No foe can prevail against God's people who are supported by a God like that. The Christian's confidence is in God, not in anything that he himself does. And for all eternity, you and I can rely on God. So as you face trials, you can have confidence that God is for you. When you're overwhelmed by your own sinfulness, when it feels like you're alone in suffering, when you aren't even sure you can keep going because of turmoil that is in your heart, when you're distracted by the world around you, when you're hungry and you're not sure how you can pay the bills or buy food, or even with a sword at your neck, you can have confidence that God is for you. Even when it feels like you're alone. How can you have confidence? Is this just positive self-talk? Hey, everything's going to be all right. Uh, maybe close your eyes and ignore the problems around you. It is not that. Look at where Paul goes, verse 32. And this is where we must dwell. And what we remember and proclaim every Sunday when we take the Lord's Supper. He who indeed did not spare his own son. That was God our Father, the one who sovereignly orchestrates all of the universe. There is not a rogue molecule in all of the universe that doesn't bow to his command. And if he did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all? things. God has accomplished the unimaginably difficult part of your salvation already. Everything else is, is light. He's done the heavy lifting. Everything from here on out for you is easy and it is guaranteed for this God. If God did not spare his own son, the sinless one, the perfect spotless one, his own eternal son, who was pierced for our transgressions and he was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. If God would do that to his own precious eternal son on our behalf, we should not doubt that even the things you're going through that you do not prefer are also good from our good God who is good and who does good and is and loves you and is committed to your salvation. John Piper writes, he said, God did not spare his own son because it was the only way that he could spare us and still be the all holy, all just God that he is. 
the guilt of our transgressions, the punishment of our iniquities, the curse of our sin that would have brought us inescapably to hell, except for Christ crucified. So at communion, you and I and everybody who has placed their trust in Christ and him alone, you need to take the bread and juice when it comes. It doesn't matter how your week has been. It doesn't matter if you've been faithful or unfaithful. Your taking this bread and juice is not dependent on you if you are in the faith. It is dependent on your, your worthiness to take this bread and juice is only dependent on what Christ accomplished the fact that you will persevere to the end and then be glorified with God forever, that's assured if you are in him. So take the bread and juice with confidence, remembering what God did on your behalf. These are reminders of the glorious truth that God did not spare his own son God doesn't ask you to ignore the difficulties of your life or to pretend like it's not hard. Jesus actually took on flesh and blood. Physical things. You're going to hold physical bread. You're going to drink physical juice. Jesus actually lived and died. These aren't just things that you think about that you hope for. These are realities that occurred and when his body was nailed to the cross, his blood poured, his physical blood poured from the many holes in his tattered body, from the holes in his wrists and his feet, the scourgings that shredded and lacerated his back, from his pierced side where blood and water flowed. He actually died for you. His body was physically buried, and then on the third day he rose from the dead, appeared to his disciples and many others, ascended to the Father, and he will return. And Jesus commanded us to eat this bread and drink this juice, to remember him and proclaim his death. So declare to yourself and everyone here the truths of Romans 8, especially the culmination in verse 32, and your confidence in God. As, John, as Puritan John Flavel concluded, surely if God would not spare his own son one stroke, one groan, one sigh, one circumstance of misery, it can never be imagined that ever he should, after this, deny or withhold from his people, for whose sakes all this was suffered, any mercies, any comforts, any privilege spiritual or temporal, which is good for them. So as you hold the bread and juice and then take it on your own as you're prepared, consider your trials, your needs, your temptations, your blessings. Consider them in light of God's commitment to your salvation. How is what you're facing this week? How is that thing you're tempted by? How is what's keeping you up at night? What's captivated your heart? How is all of those things, how are all those things brought into focus by the cross? If you're not a believer, if you haven't put your faith in Christ, these promises don't apply to you, but they could if you turn. But if you're not a believer, just let the bread and juice pass when it comes. Men, please serve us and take communion on your own as you're prepared.